So uh, here's my plagiarized version of the Olympic rings. And I actually have to confess that I didn't realize how appropriate it was that these brains were overlapping until I'd finished the talk. But I'm not going to tell you. I, I fully intended this to be a visual pun on everything I'm going to talk about. Not. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, this afternoon. We're going to go back and revisit partial Fourier again in a slightly different fashion. And I'm going to look at uh, Grappa again, uh, just as a, a comparator. And the reason I'm going to do that, I think that was better this way. The reason I'm going to do it is, is that better? Same. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm going to do that is because the Grappa method, which is really uh, uh, a sort of a philosophical approach to encoding spatial signals, it's a family of methods, really. There are many ways to do it, uh, much like EPI has become a a generic brand for uh, different ways of doing much the same thing. So that's that's what's sort of happening with Grappa, and the Grappa approach uh, is be, is being now uh, being used as a central component of this so-called simultaneous multi-slice EPI. Um, I originally had this listed as multi-band EPI. That was how the Minnesota group called it, but the original uh, inventors uh, called it simultaneous multi-slice, and that's I think now the the term that's being popularized in the literature. So this is the, the term, this and multiband imaging, uh, is the, these are the two terms to sort of keep your eyes out for uh, in the literature. This is the stuff that's uh, making the headlines at the moment. So I'm going to concentrate on this reverse partial Fourier, which is a moderately fast te technique, and this simultaneous multi-slice. And the theme isn't anything to do with the uh, sequences per se. Uh, the theme is that these are not things that come stock with your scanner. These are things that have to be added on uh, under the auspices of a research agreement. Right? So these are uh, research methods that somebody else has written and uh, you might or might not want to get access to. So you, what I talked to you about in this reverse partial Fourier, and this stuff is going to require some paperwork and some, uh, some software to be in, uh, imposed on your scanner. So this is sort of a glimpse, if you like, of, uh, of your future. This morning I mentioned that you could uh, you could chop out the bottom or the top half. In fact, you could also chop the left half or the right half. There's uh, conjugate symmetry, so-called, uh, in in all quadrants of this K space. Now, what's taking the time is the sampling in this direction. So we either want to chop off the top echoes or the bottom echoes. And presumably one of those is preferred, and there will be different potential uh, uh, experimental consequences of doing that. And I'm going to try and go through this quickly because I think this isn't something that you're going to want to, to leap onto. It's a, it's a small tweak from, uh, from the, the default protocol. It's useful, but it's not essential. So if we want to omit the early echoes, we simply start our journey in case space, and we just go to a part of the way... Uh, across the case-based plane, and then we finish the, uh, the, the rest of the sampling. Or the traditional way, this is the one that does come standard on your scanner. This is the one if you enable the button that says partial Fourier, this is what you get. Um, this only uh, locks off the, sorry, other way around. This is the one that's the default. The early echoes is the default. This is the one that's not standard on your scanner. This is the one that uh, can be a useful uh, tool in your toolbox if you just want to add a few slices in TR. Um, now, why would it make a difference? Well, I mentioned this morning that if you emit the uh, early echoes, what you allow is a shorter echo time, which is great for ASL, arterial spin labeling, or uh, other methods where you don't care about the TE or you want the TE to be as short as possible. But in fMRI, we always want a particular TE because there's always an optimal TE for the functional contrast. So we have a constraint. We can, we, there's no point in just omitting the early echoes. And one thing we never want to be doing in fMRI is nothing. We always want to be doing something. We want to be encoding information and reading information from the scanner all the time. Dead periods are just wrong. They should not be, not be happening. So what we don't want to do is twiddle our thumbs for you know, five, six, eight milliseconds, whatever this takes, and then start acquiring data. That's an absolute waste of time. So in this case, you can probably recognize that if I've started, if I have to get from all the way through this journey, and I have to get to this central point at a particular time, which is the definition of the echo time, 
And if this is fixed, this half is fixed, then there's no point in omitting the early echoes. But omitting the late echoes makes an awful lot of sense because as soon as I've finished with this current slice, I can move on to the next slice. So I can jump ahead. So I want to definitely omit the late echoes. There's a potential benefit. There's the performance. If I do full Fourier, this is the standard uh, EPI sequence. I can get about 37 slices with an echo time of 22. And if I push uh, the early echoes off the, the acquisition, then I can get to about 40 slices. I can get to 44 slices, however, if I omit the late echoes only. So from 37 to 44, that's what, 30%? That's pretty good, 20%. That's not a bad game. Why does it not matter particularly what my echo time is? Now, this is going to be hard to say. I apologize. I should have redone this figure years ago. I think I stole it from Peter Gisard in Oxford. Anyway, these are curves for different areas of the brain. And in red is the orbital frontal cortex. And in, uh, let's see, auditory cortex, no. Uh, let's see, I can't even see it on that one. It's too small. One of these is motor cortex, and one of these, the magenta, I think, is motor cortex. It's, um, sorry, the cyan is motor cortex. And I think the blue is visual cortex. What this is basically showing is your bold functional uh, contrast curves. This is how much signal to noise you get, or functional signal to noise, as you change the echo time. In this case, from um, about 10 milliseconds on the left to about 40 milliseconds on the right. Notice that. None of these values are zero. The, the medium value here is about 250 or 260 units. This is a unitless measure. So you've got some fairly smooth curves here. Now, the reason why the occipital cortex and the auditory cortex are pushed earlier to these shorter echo times is because of those magnetic susceptibility gradients. So that just says to us that because of the distortions in the magnetic field, because of the presence of bony structures, the skull, the sinuses, in those parts of the brain, that we have to use a shorter echo time if we want to get the maximum sensitivity for those areas. But if we do that, we will then pay a small penalty in terms of the maximum sensitivity for the occipital cortex, the parietal cortex, and so on. So this is one of those trade-offs that you have to establish in fMRI. Now, if you notice the smoothness of a lot of these curves, especially where uh, you're uh, in the occipital and, and parietal cortex, it really doesn't make a huge difference if you're between... Um, about uh, what's this, this 20 milliseconds here, and that's 30 milliseconds. It's not a massive difference for a lot of these. Certainly around 28 to 30 milliseconds, everything comes out in the wash. Now, one thing that's not shown on this plot, but a couple of people have asked me about, so I'll mention it here, is that this curve, or all these curves, change if you change the size of the voxel. In general, the smaller the voxel, the longer the echo time you should be using to get the bold contrast. And that's because of what I drew on the board earlier, when I make this, the voxel smaller, I make the dephasing less. All the nasty stuff I don't want to happen, all the dephasing gradients and the, the magnetic susceptibility, those uh, become much less of a problem. So in general, is there a throw my numbers for you? If you're doing a uh, filler, for example, um, with three millimeter resolution, the optimum TE is around about 28 milliseconds. If you can get that voxel resolution down to about 2.4 milliseconds, uh, sorry, 2.4 millimeters, isotropic, then you can put the echo time out to about 38 milliseconds, and you'll get a much bigger signal contrast to emotional stimuli. Okay, that's been shown in the literature. Uh, Sonia Lab used it. Uh, a number of uh, labs use that as a basis for uh, selecting small resolution and longer echo times in order to get a meaningful cor cortex. So, of course, now the problem with that is you decrease the total coverage. You can't necessarily do your brain. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Okay, and oh. This morning I said, I can't see that. They won't be able to see that. Oh, there you go. Three, two, one, eight, one. Moving on. Anyone would leave that up? There you go. So there's your, there's your curves. Um, but just do remember that, that that's, a, that's a, an approximation. And of course it varies depending on the subjects. But in general, TE between 20 and 40, meh, not a big deal. Uh, except if you're really trying to push uh, the best that you can get for very small books. See how much uh, you've learned about being a skeptic, and so somebody pointed out on the physicist bearing gifts. Uh, so I just pitched to you something called reverse fMRI, reverse motion free EPI, and it's a 
it was uh, nine more slices for free. Uh, modest change in the echo time, a little bit of smoothing as you saw this morning, uh, maybe a little bit of dropout here and there. Right? So maybe the questions you should be asking. What's the downside? Okay, so that sounds fantastic, but what am I giving up? What are the additional risks? The signal loss that I made this morning, I'm just going to show uh, a little bit more uh, in, in detail because it's quite interesting. We can control it somewhat, and we have control over a number of parameters. So we can interact. Uh, the reason why you can signal loss is, and this is, a, this is a sort of a physical answer to a question that I think you've asked me over lunch. Why is it that in certain directions you place slices in certain axes and you get more signal or less signal, it depends where you are in the brain. Well, the case-based trajectories that I show you, they're the ones that we would like to happen if the sample was perfect. Those are the ones that we try to apply with the gradients that we can control. We have an X and a Y and a Z gradient, that's it. So we control those gradients. What we can't control with our pulse program on the scanner is the magnetic susceptibility gradients in your subject's head. They're just intrinsic, they're just there. We have to work with them. And we can think of them as sort of spoiler channels. There's an X component, a Y component, a Z component. There's also an X squared component. There's an X squared times Z component. There's all these weird spatial combinations. We can do nothing about them. Once we've shimmed, we just get what we get. So the local case-based trajectory <coughs> is never the ideal case-based trajectory. It's modulated by the sum of the applied gradients, the gradients that we use, and the magnetic susceptibility gradients that are intrinsic. And because they vary across the brain, that means that the actual case-based trajectory that the spins experience varies across the brain too. So the case-based trajectory in the back is different than the case-based trajectory in the front. Okay? So that's where this case-based, uh, this, this dropout problem comes from. Um, frontal and temporal lobes, they're the, the two hardy perennial uh, problem areas of the brain. Uh, I haven't talked about deep gray matter uh, regions, but you can basically say the same thing for deep gray structures as well. Um, now, this is an interesting observation, however. We're going to have some degree of choice if we can omit the early echoes or the late echoes. Remember, if, the, if there's an asymmetry in the case space and we've got this weird stretching of signals, then if the signals disappear if we omit the early echoes, but it stays when we, omit the, uh, we, when we uh, lose the late echoes, we can choose which signals to lose. We don't have to say, right, we're always going to lose the uh, occipital uh, signals. We can decide whether we want to keep the occipital signals or not, and we can pay a penalty somewhere else. So we have some exchanges we can make. We can never do better than the full case-based coverage. That's our gold standard, but we're trying to go faster here. We're trying to get a little bit more bang for our buck. We're prepared to give up a little something uh, in order to get some more slices. There's another consequence, though. If I'm going faster, and I'm going to use this technique, or we, when I say I, I, I mean the royal we, it, the field will use this technique when we come to doing uh, the, these multi, simultaneous multi-slice uh, experiments. We use partial Fourier uh, by, by default uh, because we need to set the echo time at a particular value. If we, want, if we have uh, an increase in speed, if we can do more slices within the TR, we can make our slices thinner. That also allows us to recover signal, which we talked about before lunch. So going faster actually helps in signal coverage, and it helps in uh, resolution as well. Okay? So we've got some control over uh, which signals we lose and why. So this is from a phantom. I apologize for not having brain data. I just didn't have any with me. I don't know what happens. I've got DVDs of this stuff, but it, it shows the example anyway. So there's a full case space image from a phantom, a structural phantom. And I'm just going to toggle between that and the 6 eighths partial Fourier. So here, we're losing the early echoes. So you can see, if you look at the very top slices especially, uh, up here, you can see that. These are regions, the, the top portions of these slices tend to <coughs> get darker when I go from full case space to partial case space. The bottom of the slices, pretty much the same. Okay. Contrast that with the reversed 6 eighths. What I'm calling reverse 6 eighths basically means losing the late echoes rather than the early echoes. So there's the late echoes and there's the full case space. There's the echoes, there's the full case space. So now 
the top of the slices is pretty much unchanged, and it's the bottom of the slices that pays the penalty. So now we can decide which part of the image uh, pays the biggest cost. Okay. Uh, reverse partial Fourier, uh, sorry, the standard partial Fourier doesn't really give you very much. It only gives you a, a small handful of slices. We've already seen that the uh, omitting the late echoes gives you a little bit more, uh, about twice as much bang for your buck, so you get about 20, 25 percent slices. That's as good as you can do with grappa. So if I'm asked which would I do, grappa or partial, uh, partial Fourier, uh, the, this reverse partial Fourier, then I would select the reverse partial Fourier because I don't then have to even think about the motion issue. It's going to have the same motion sensitivity as the standard fMRI experiment, the standard EPI. So I've got the speed gain I want with no further headache. I've got a little tiny signal drop, but hey, there's signal uh, issues in Grappa too. That's that point there, motion sensitivity. So if all you're interested in is going slightly faster, this is a great tactic to consider. Um, I mentioned this morning the smoothing issue. Uh, in general, that's not something that you guys uh, will worry about because you're probably going to smooth for statistical reasons anyway. Um, if you're uh, interested in doing sort of data-driven models and you want to maintain the native resolution, then maybe uh, something to worry about. But I think uh, the smoothing intrinsic to EPI is already probably uh, sufficiently large that, uh, that this additional factor is probably not going to be a big concern for you. Okay. Now, if we can choose the uh, early or the late echoes, is there anything else we can do? Can we decide which, e which echoes are early and which echoes are late? Well, yes, we can, because we don't have to start at the top of case space and work to the bottom. We can start at the bottom and work to the top. We can reverse the phase encode direction. It's very trivial to do. Uh, we can, this, this is assuming axial slices. Uh, we can do posterior to anterior or anterior to posterior. This is just turning the uh, axis of uh, phase encoding upside down. So the image distortion will change. If, a, if a, an image is stretched in one direction, it'll be compressed in the other. So this isn't something you do in isolation. You've got to think about the effects on uh, distortion. But if we're just, first of all, worrying about, um, about uh, coverage and we want to get a few extra slices, then this is, uh, this is the way to do it. Um, what did I put down here? Ah, right. So my a side note down here is you can also do this control of phase encoding direction if you're just doing plain EPI, right? Full case based EPI, the default protocol. Um, I, I believe, actually, this is a, an issue where um, Siemens has made a, a bad choice on the default. I think the uh, GE default is posterior to anterior, so they start bottom and work up. And Siemens starts at the top and works down, anterior to posterior. Uh, and I think that means that the frontal lobe is a compression in Siemens images, and it's a stretch in GE images. If you're trying to fix distortion with a field map, it's much better to have a stretched signal, because then those pixels aren't all coalesced on top of each other. Once they coalesce, you can't fix them. They can, you can only replace this voxel in one new position in space. So in general, stretches are, are preferred. So this is something also, it's an aside. I mentioned it just for you guys who are already doing fMRI. Uh, I think the F-Burn protocol that Gary Glover was involved in, that they, they forced um, posterior to anterior for Siemens. So I think some Siemens sites have taken that on as a default. Good. So this is what we're going to do. So there's the early echoes currently defined. There's the late echoes currently defined. Piece of cake. Job done. So we can define early or late, and we can decide ahead of time which echoes we're going to lose. So uh, here's, this is, an, this is actually GE data. I stole this from, from, from Gary. I've been doing some stuff on QA recently, so I was just happening to look at this, uh, this data recently. So this is an example just showing how the frontal lobe uh, is a stretch in the posterior to anterior direction and a compression in the anterior to posterior. This should look much more typical for Siemens users. This probably doesn't look very typical because you're probably not doing P to A. The way you set this is very straightforward. I can email a D and she can let you guys know. <coughs> it's very easy to do if you don't know how to do it. All right. Now we get to the fun, sexy stuff. Any, any questions on any of the partial Fourier before we move on? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, 
Um, golly. So thin slices for sure, if you can. Um, there's very little you can do with axial slices. You just sort of get what you get. You probably don't want to use partial Fourier if you can avoid it. I would stay with full Fourier. Um, and there's, that's, that's probably the only trick you can play. I don't think even the, um, in fact, let's go back. I don't think, it doesn't quite go down far enough. I don't, I don't think posterior and anterior is going to help you very much there. This frontal lobe there, it makes a big difference. In fact, there would be a danger, of course, is uh, there actually is, there's a hidden issue there. Um, I'm not familiar enough with that region. Now, you should check the literature on that or email me and I'll see what I can dig out. Um, Leon, do you know if anyone's doing PA for... Yeah. Let's, I mean, let's, excuse the bad pun, it's a sparse literature for auditory <laughs> fMRI. There's not much to draw upon. You mentioned boxer size, you mentioned boxer size. Is there a difference uh, in the... In the in plane or in uh, transmission system? For which direction? In general, you mean you mean signal for smaller boxes? When we when we do can decrease by decreasing in plane and uh, decreasing in uh, size system. Sorry. There is a difference when uh, when you change whether you change the direction. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, probably not. Um, the signal dropout issue for full Fourier. If you're not doing partial Fourier at all, shouldn't be different um, to a first approximation. No, no, a susceptibility gradient that was additive now becomes subtractive. You know, so that's what's going to drive the distortion, whether it becomes a stretch or a compression. Uh, so yeah, there would definitely be a measurable effect, but whether it's worth worrying about, I would doubt. I would probably consider that's a, a detail. I would probably, because there are so many trade-offs already built into this, I would probably prioritize based on if you're worried about distortion, uh, getting a stretch in the key regions and making that a priority. Um, and then that, that would probably preclude any further changes. And then the resolution you do as well as you can do before you run out of coverage. Again, you've just got to prioritize the main areas. Because the larger in-plane resolution you have, the more signal I get. So people suggest increasing in-plane resolution and decreasing yeah, the, the, so there's always trade, right, there, there, is, there isn't a simple answer to that. Uh, in general, you want, you never want anything to be to be thicker than it can be. You always want the smallest voxels you can get as a general rule. Because although the signal to noise volumetrically is going down, you don't care because you just want the change in signal to noise that results in activation. So provided going getting smaller voxels doesn't drive up the physiologic noise, provided the ratio of signal changes that you're interested in to signal changes that you don't care about stays about the same, then there, sh there, there should be no uh, negative effect to going smaller and having lower signal to noise. Um, and likewise, it, so, so the dephasing issue tends to be worst in the uh, slice direction, second worst in the uh, phase encoding direction because you're using the weakest gradients in that direction in, in plane gradients and then last worst best uh, in the um, the readout direction the, the, the frequency encoding direction so if you have if you ever have a choice and you know that you're going to get uh, dephasing gradients you always you you put the readout axis along that direction to overcome the background susceptibility gradients in the worst direction the second worst direction then becomes the phase encoding direction and the and the, the absolute worst, uh, sorry, the absolute best becomes the the uh, slice direction. And that's why coronal slices are how they are, okay? Because that that's basically minimizing the through plane dephasing effect. That's the best way to cover the brain for through plane dephasing. It's just the least efficient way to cover the brain. <coughs> cool. Okay. Any other phase encoding or direction questions? Partial Fourier questions? Okay. Uh, one quick aside, I'm, so this, uh, this uh, reverse partial Fourier method, I'm going to try and make available through Siemens so you can get it. Um, I don't have, my, I have a different scanner from you, so I don't have the same operating, the same software, so I can't just create the software and send it to you, which is what I would do otherwise. Um, but if I can find a way to do that, 
then that's what will happen. <coughs> and uh, whether Siemens knows about it or not, it's always ask, easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Okay. So, this is uh, where things get pretty exciting. Um, so, I've only been playing with this sequence since oh, about October. Um, and it's a bit slightly ironic uh, because one of the variants of this appeared in a 2010 article in uh, PLOS One by David Feinberg. And it's got a lot of press. Um, I don't know if anybody knows David. David David's an interesting case. Uh, he's, a, he's a nice guy. We get on uh, as friends, but he's just a really tough guy to work with. Um, David is a classic physicist, so he makes he comes up with great ideas and makes really crappy products. He's not an engineer, so you never want to use David's pulse sequences. You want to take David's ideas, recode them, and use those. So that's what people have been doing. He sort of set this uh, revolution going, and other people have come along uh, and started tweaking those early ideas. And now we've got something that looks uh, and, and seems to work pretty well. So the stuff I'm going to show you today came from the University of Minnesota. Uh, the, sequ the, the data is acquired on my scanner in the last couple of months, but the sequence was written by the University of Minnesota, uh, and there are two versions in there uh, that are out in the field that we can get uh, for, y for your scanner. So these are things that you can get under the auspices of a research agreement. You can have this soon on your scanner. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this Phase array coil. This is the array coil I mentioned this morning, lots of little loops. We're going to look at one. We're going to see what makes, it, makes this thing work. And I put a comment here that it has to be a non-TIM coil. TIM is an acronym that uh, Siemens uses for a total imaging matrix, which is a way of handling the signals from their array coils. Uh, it turns out that the array coil, uh, the, the TIM uh, architecture, doesn't play so nicely with these multiband sequences. Um, I, on my scanner, I have a 12-channel coil that has this Tim Balaki, and I have a 32-channel coil that doesn't. So we use the 32-channel coil. I'm going to find out very soon whether your Skyra 24-channel, the new system here, uh, whether it will work on the 24-channel. I seem to, I may have dreamt it, but I seem to remember that David Feinberg told me that uh, he managed to get the, one of his sequences working quite well on, the 12, on my 12-channel coil. So if it works well on my 12, it'll work very well on your 24, but I've got, to, I've got to verify that. Okay. As another general property, we want lots of coil loops to encode space. So we want something that looks more like a, an MEG helmet than an MRI coil in order to encode uh, space as efficiently as possible. Now, there's going to be a limit to that, and we don't know where that is yet. That's something for the physicists to figure out, uh, but you can't buy this stuff yet. Anyway, so you don't care. I'm just going to mention the... the, the uh, the physical limitations that we're, that we're considering. What's going to happen is we're going to do something that looks a lot like Grappa, which, given what I've told you this morning, should set alarm bells ringing, uh, appropriately so. But this is how it's going to loosely work. We're going to acquire a bunch of reference EPI data. It's going to look somewhat like the ACS scans that we talked about this morning. Uh, and these are going to be... Um, just regular EPI, this is going to be acquired very slowly compared to the super fast sequence that we're going to acquire for our time series. So this takes about, say, eight seconds. We acquire this data, we tuck it away, and then we use this data to reconstruct the images on the, fl on the fly. Instead of acquiring a single slice at one time, so right now you do chunk, detect, chunk, detect, chunk, detect. In this method, we're going to go chunk four slices at the same time, or six slices at the same time, detect them all. Then we're going to go chunk. We're going to do another four or six slices at the same time. Then we're going to move down. We're going to do multiple sets of slices simultaneously. All the signals are called come back or higgledy-piggledy. We're going to sort them out in post-processing, knowing something about the system. So I'm going to show you the pulse sequence, and it will look very similar to what the regular EPI pulse sequence looks like. Most of the magic actually happens behind the scenes. We're actually going to apply, instead of a single, single uh, slice vector pulse, multiple slice selective pulses. That's the, that's the part that really makes this uh, uh, efficient. That's where you get the speed gain. And then we're going to use either sense or grapple or some kind of reconstruction method mathematically. We don't care. We just push a button on the computer and it goes, here's a pic picture. Fabulous. Uh, we just you know, uh, 
uh, need to know if it's good or not. So this is uh, in the box. Uh, this is stuff that the physicists, the clever people at Minnesota and MGH are working out for us. We're just going to take their product, and then we're going to go road test it. We're going to see if it works like they say it does, because, of course, we want to be aware of physicists bearing gifts. So you didn't see this, because I've just violated my warranty, <laughs> actually my research agreement, uh, my um, uh, maintenance agreement. So this never happened. But if it did, <laughs> this is loosely what the, out, the uh, inferior surface, the bottom surface of a 32-channel coil on a Siemens system looks like. So these are the plugs. You won't see these kinds of plugs on your Skyra. It has these clever optical plugs. But anyway, this is the older style with copper plugs. And if you look, you can see these little hexagonal, it's a bit of a soccer ball, really. There's little sort of hexagonal overlapping elements. Each one of those is a, an electrical, a separate electrical coil. So it's a bit like radar. So the first order of decoupling between these two loops is purely the physical overlap. So there's a geometry, there's a clever geometry that these guys, the electrical engineers, play. And if you, having them this far apart, the cross, cross torque is zero, increasing cross torque, maximum cross torque at this point. If you find some halfway house, you can minimize the cross torque between these coils, and then they use clever electronics to sort out the rest. And this thing works like 32 independent copper loops that are all but oblivious to the other coils around them. It's pretty amazing stuff. That's what $70,000 US can buy you. I would have preferred a 5 Series BMW, but they told me to buy a coil. I guess I'd have bought an Audi now. I like the R6 or the R8, but anyway. So here's a schematic. Uh, this is a paper that if you're interested in this stuff, you should download this tonight and read it and get very excited. It's David Feinberg and Corinne Settenpop just published this. It, uh, I just got the Science Direct notification uh, a couple of days ago that this is out in EPUB. It's published in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance. It's a review article. Uh, given that David wrote it, it's actually written quite well. Korean must be a, have a second life as an author because David doesn't write so good. Um, but it's a nice article. It's got some nice uh, information in it. Uh, it's not going to explain everything, all the intricacies to you, but it's not a bad place to start and then work back into the uh, other technical references. Hopefully, by then, you'll be an expert. So here's what we're going to do. Here's David's uh, rendering of the coil elements in one dimension. And... I think he meant that these blue lines are supposed to be equidistant, but in any case, it doesn't matter. So there's three slices being simultaneously excited. This is how it's actually played out in the scanner. So this is our slice selection gradient. And for those of you who know about such things, we change the carrier frequency. So we change the, the central frequency for each one of these little uh, sync-shaped functions. And so this messed-up waveform is actually the sum of these three. These are slightly phase-shifted from each other. They're not identical. And when we do that, we end up with three slabs in space simultaneously. Now, there's no limit, in principle, to how many slabs we can do in space at the same time. The limit, practically, becomes how far these slices are in space relative to the spacing between these coils. So this is the limitation now in terms of the acceleration. And uh, just uh, for the punchline, people, I think, have gone up to about 12 simultaneous slices, so literally more than an order of magnitude faster than you were doing you know, six months ago, which is just remarkable. OK, so, but with a 32-channel coil, uh, I've used uh, acceleration factors of six, and it just works beautifully. That's what I'm going to show you today. Um, you could probably push it farther, but um, I, th I think for now, given that we haven't done uh, a lot of validation, I think that's probably as far as we want to go. So there's, a, there's an example of what we do with three slices. So there's an echo planar sequence also stolen from the same publication. The slice select uh, RF pulse here doesn't look any different than what you would see in a conventional fMRI see, or an EPI sequence. It's just that we happen to know that there are multiple simultaneous pulses going on here, okay? in this case, three. Uh, we can control the flip angle the same way. We can do a 90-degree pulse, a 40-degree pulse. We have the same full control over the flip angle. What Karin Sertzenpop did, this is, this, is, this is the guy responsible for making this all work. So, 2001, a guy called Larkman came up with an original idea to do it in the spine. It kind of worked so-so. It's not so bad in the spine because the spine array coils are quite far apart. So it made, it made some headway in uh, spine imaging. Uh, people started trying about 2005, 2006 to do brain imaging with it for uh, anatomical scans. Uh, they, got, they made some progress. Then Feinberg came along in 2010, and he did a combined 
uh, uh, MB2, so just two slices simultaneously, with another uh, experiment that he'd invented and got a really rapid scan. And from there, just the whole thing just exploded. Suddenly, everybody was coming up with tweaks. Uh, Karin Sertzenpop is responsible for this bit here. It's called kyperenia. In, we're all alcoholics, I think, in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in MI physics. Everything's named after a drink. So there's this, this is the technique name known as kyperenia. It was uh, an old technique used many years ago for a completely different use. So he's just simply recognized that you can play the same trick. You don't you really need to care about what these blips do. There's just some extra blips going on in the slice direction. Right? Um, and if you do three slices and you want to separate these three slices, you want this ratio to be one to one to three. That's all we need to know. So here's what's going to happen in this magic black box. We're going to read back in our example of three simultaneous slices, three slices all piled on top of each other, but with one crucial magic ingredient created by Cohen's clever little blips. What this is going to do is impose a shift in the field of view for each of those three slices separately. So based on the position of the slice relative to the blips in, in, the, in the blip gradient direction, You've got one slice, the main slice, which is uh, slice number uh, two here. Slice number two is central, but slices number one and three are shifted in the field of view. That's important because it allows the reconstruction algorithm to actually unsort these and get what we want, which is the three unsorted separated slices. So prior to sets and pop, you got something that was kind of like a bit of a dog's breakfast. You got a loose, loose separation, but it wasn't uh, anything that you would... Uh, you would necessarily want to use for something like fMRI. The artifacts were just too high. So that's what the actual data looks like when it comes back from the scanner. It still looks like a dog's breakfast. So there's the blips, and we call it blips kaipi here. So there's the field of view three over three shifts. This is uh, the, the next step. So we unsort the slices, but we've left in the field of view shift. Uh, there's one set of three. There's another set of three acquired immediately afterwards. And then because we know it's exactly one-third of a field of view shift every second or third slice, it's trivial just to simply rotate these around and fix them. And now, voila, we have what we want, which is our six perfect slices in the bottom. Okay? So a lot of magic goes into this, but at the end of the day, this is what we get out. Okay, so I got this sequence in uh, October, and I have to thank Sonia Bishop for getting this. She wanted to collaborate with the guys at Oxford, and they were using this already. Um, and so she, she did the paperwork to, to get this sequence, and uh, uh, I think since she got it, everybody pretty much has jumped on it. Jack Gallant certainly jumped on it. His guys are tearing away with this, so it's pretty cool. Um, <coughs> I just let you look at the numbers. It doesn't look that impressive until you look at the numbers. That's fast. That's really high resolution, and that is fast. So, okay, they didn't quite get all the cerebellum in this particular prescription. I didn't get all of the cerebellum, but I've got, you can't see it on your screen, but I've got three slices here with just fat in the top of the head. Uh, so I could easily have moved down by three slices. Um, and this is with uh, acceleration factor of six. Hey, I could have gone to acceleration factor of eight. So I could have done, uh, I have to do factors of the acceleration factor R, so this is 72 slices. I could have done uh, 78 slices uh, in about, what, 1.4 seconds. How many more do you want? Or if that wasn't good enough for you, I could have gone to an acceleration factor of 8 and probably done this thing in under a second. Right? Same coverage. Yeah? You were listening this morning, weren't you? That's a good question. That's the question I asked. In fact, that was the first question I asked. When I saw this come out in the literature, I went, this is never going to work. I saw Grappa and I went, oh, stay away. It's going to be an absolute disaster. I could just, I could just see a huge time sink. My life wasted. You know, you know, I'm going to be penniless and poor and just despondent. I just thought, what a way. I, I'm going to be the person that, you know. The other thing about these methods is nobody ever gets any credit for finding the flaws in them. It's a thankless task. Don't do it. Stay on the, the, the positive results. You could, be, you could have been right about the housing crisis in the U.S. Unless you were shorting the housing market at the time, nobody cares. Unless you made a billion dollars off of it, nobody remembers you were right. Nobody cares. So being right, yeah, it's useful. 
anyway, I looked at the motion sensitivity first, just from a distance, just looking at the literature, and I thought, oh, this is just going to be horrendous. Hold that thought. Because it's interesting. So there's the parameters listed out for you. So this is an acceleration factor of six. So we're doing six slices across the brain simultaneously. I can't even spread my fingers wide enough. And one left. 72 slices, two millimeter isotropic voxels. The echo time is necessarily set to 40 milliseconds, and we have to use 6.8 partial Fourier because we've got so many echoes. This is a 128 matrix now, 128 by 128 data points in our matrix. Our echo spacing is 0.8 milliseconds. So we've got so many echoes that we are forced to use partial Fourier because we simply can't get the echo time down to where we need it for bold uh, activation unless we do. So here we're using the regular Siemens partial Fourier. We're uh, doing 6.8 partial Fourier. But at the end of the day, it seems to work, right? We get, we get uh, uh, the, the echo time that we're after. So let's look a little bit more in detail at the data and the data quality. So this is just wanted to show you sort of the steps that go into this. You get these if you decide to click the button and pull these off the scanner. You get these reference images as well. So these aren't like the ACS data in traditional graphite because they're actual data sets actual images, and you can look at them. You can take them away. They have different contrast to the accelerated scans that are in the time series because these guys have to be there. We're acquiring these without the acceleration scan. So we can't blitz along the whole brain every 1.3 seconds. We're only getting uh, one-sixth of the total number of slices every 1.6 seconds. So we've got a one-sixth, second six, third six, fourth six. So this whole data set takes R times T R, so 6 times 1300, so about 8 seconds to acquire all of this. So the spin history from the excitations, each of these spins is being hit every 1.3 seconds. Each of these guys is being hit by one point, every 1.3 over 6 seconds. So we're, hitting, we're, we're tapping the spins much, much more rapidly, so we're getting a different T1 contrast here. So we see different intensities, especially for the CSF. I don't care about it. I'm just pointing it out because I just think it's interesting and it's nice to understand what you're seeing. So now you start to look at the, the, the downsides. Let's see, see where the artifacts come out. You know, where, do, where, do, where does the bad stuff hide? There must be bad stuff, right? Uh, where does it hide? So this is, if I crank up the, the background contrast, it's, I'm afraid it's extremely difficult to see here. Um, it's hard to see on my screen, but it's really hard to see there. You can sort of see the microscope in the regular EPI. There's these guys here. Anyone who does fMRI will be intimately familiar with these little pesky beasts. This, is, by the way, is a consequence of that rastering backwards and forwards in the K-space matrix. The fact that you're going backwards and forwards effectively means that time runs forwards, then backwards, then forwards, then backwards. And when you time reverse half of the, the echoes, anything that was a, uh, a delay in one direction becomes an an early delay, if you can think of such a thing, in the other direction. So uh, we get asymmetries. We get a zigzag in offsets across K-space with EPI. It's just a, an intrinsic property of the technique. So this is a characteristic of EPI. It's not a bad thing. It's just it is what it is. We see the same kind of ghosting in our accelerated scan. That's good, or, or it's, not, it's not bad anyway. And what you can't see there uh, is not probably a big consequence, but there's what we call residual aliasing. So the, the reconstruction method isn't perfect, and it's going to leave some signals that are improperly located outside of uh, proper signal regions. So I haven't got this uh, picture here, but one of the experiments I've done is just to uh, take a phantom, a, a spherical phantom, fully sample it in three dimensions, then re-slice it, and just see what kind of structure these artifacts have. And they're, they're periodic, as you would expect. They look like they have symmetries associated with the number six. That makes sense to me because we're doing acceleration factor of six. So there's a lot of structure with, uh, with, with structural periodicity that, uh, that I can uh, explain. Again, whether that's a bad thing in fMRI terms uh, has yet to be proven, but I, I suspect that if it's uh, down in the noise level, then it's probably uh, not a problem. So that's, that's just what it looks like. Okay? So if you do this stuff, that's what you're expecting to see. So the big caution here, this is a very preliminary work. Um, and we're, we, at this point, we're not even quite sure how to go about approaching 
the testing of this sequence. Okay. Um, we've got some ideas. We're doing some phantom experiments. The, the, the downside with that is you don't get the same contrast. There's also an issue of motion correction and whether that could interfere with our testing. But in any case, I'll show you what I found so far, and I was very pleasantly surprised. So again, this is the temporal signals noise image. This is a nice throwaway uh, analysis of, of signal stability. So this is uh, with no intentional motion. It doesn't look that good on the screen, but it's actually, well, this, all that matters is how this compares to the, uh, to the accelerated scans. So if you sort of, you see the same kind of features as, you, as I showed you this morning in, uh, in your, um, with, with the full case space and partial case space comparisons. Very typical features, this bowl-shaped dip, that's a property of using the 32-channel coil. By the way, as another aside, the more channels you have in your coil, the more accentuated this bowl becomes. So if I was to compare 12 to 32, the 12-channel would have a shallow bowl, the 32 would have a much deeper bowl. That's just because the coil elements, as, you get, as they become more numerous, they get smaller, and that means that their sensitivity profile becomes more restricted too. So it becomes much more difficult to sample the little tiny signal in the middle from the contribution of 32 individual coils as it does from 12 bigger coils around the brain. So this is another consequence. This is all very understandable. I saw this. It, was, it didn't bother me at all. There's nothing uh, unexpected and nothing uh, not to like about that image. So now, if I intentionally have the subject move during the calibration step, that's that eight seconds of unaccelerated scans, that's what happens to the temporal signal's noise. So I'm going to flip backwards and forwards between a couple of times. There's a good one. There's a bad one. There's a good one. There's a bad one. There's a good one. There's a bad one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. If you move during the calibration, that's essential spatial information. It only makes sense that the data should get worse. Okay. On solid ground. That's what happens. If the subject doesn't move during the auto calibration or during the reference scans, but then does move subsequent to the calibration scans, this is exactly backwards from what we saw with Grappa. So with Grappa, when I went from stationary to movement during the ACS, that was just a huge hit. That just devastated the experiment. What's interesting here is it's only movement after the calibration scans that makes the big difference. It's a very, very surprising result. I don't know what to tell you here, because it's all new to me, uh, except that it's backwards compared to Grappa. I did find this sentence in uh, David Feinberg's recent paper, and this might explain it, so I'll just read to you. So during the Grappa kernel estimation, that's the mathematical fit, the pre-scan calibration data acquired one slice at a time, so that's the, the entirety of the reference data, is summed to create a synthesized collapsed data set. So Essentially, they're going to create the problem from the perfect data. And then they use a graphic kernel to calculate for each of the slices to best estimate the individual slice pre-scan data. So I think what this is saying is they can take a step from the perfect world into the imperfect world. You can't do that with regular grappa. You've only got imperfect information. And so it seems like by knowing more about that, by having a set of perfect data at the beginning, uh, even if it's a little bit motion contaminated, it seems to be much more robust to the motion and you can still get a much better estimate uh, out of the, the data uh, provided it's not you know, horrendously motion contaminated. So a little bit of motion during that, resting, uh, during that reference scan seemed not to, to make a difference. If this is an explanation, I need to think about it some more, I need to test it some more, but that's certainly a, a good clue to uh, start to work on. What I can tell you today is I've done this uh, five, six, seven, eight times. I don't even remember how many times I've tried to break the damn thing the same way. Uh, it doesn't break the same, it just does the same thing over and over. It just, uh, the uh, re reference scans don't seem to have an innate uh, motion sensitivity. Okay. Yeah. Why am I so pleased? Oh. Hmm. Oh. So one thing I also haven't mentioned, so again, because this is very preliminary, I don't have a lot of in-depth information. The movement sensitivity is 
I'm going to use a throwaway order of magnitude, say, is an order of magnitude lower than with in-plane grappa. So with in-plane grappa, uh, I don't know if you saw my blog post, but basically if you wiggle your toes, you can see it in the data. It's that sensitive. With these experiments, we were literally nodding our heads, like perceptibly nodding our heads, and we, with, almost with no padding. You know, It was just a complete, because we were just try, trying to break it. Right? I, just, I, I knew it was going to fail. I, I just needed to be proved right. And I couldn't. It didn't work this, the way I thought it was going to work. So this, uh, mag I have no numbers on this, but the amount of motion that's in this data is huge. And yet you're getting usable data back. So I can't. I haven't done quantitative analyses yet, but the sort of motion that would have devastated an in-plane grappa scan is going to make a few percent difference on this. It's just incredibly robust to motion, and the really useful thing is that robustness at the start of the of the scan, because there's just no good way once the once the once the reference data is corrupted, there's just no good way to get back on track. So it's really important. There's a huge advantage over in-plane grappa. Um, as well as there being an overall improved motion sensitivity. I hope I have an answer for you within the next year. If somebody doesn't beat me to it, I'll figure it out. So let's look a little bit at the issues that uh, apply to you as an experimentalist, as a neuroscientist. So it looks good. Beware of physicists bearing gifts. It's not validated, etc. But the offer, uh, the gain in spatial and temporal resolution is just staggering. So there are people doing uh, whole brain analyses. I think they're doing about 2.2 millimeter isotropic voxels, sampling at about 400 milliseconds. Full brain, something like 90 slices. Uh, you know, it's just a huge, a staggering uh, improvement. So if you're interested in uh, functional connectivity like Steve Smith is, You've just got a huge, you've got a whole extra dimension of information to play with. So he's just having a good old time with ICA, trying to figure out what it all means. Um, Jack Gallant's group are using this now. They're trying to test it just because they want information. They're just encoding. There's just a huge uh, dimension, uh, increased dimension uh, of information. Um, so that's, that's the plus side. So if you have a question that's either robust to your method or uh, can't be answered unless you have this kind of spatial or temporal resolution, then this is something to start to think about because it looks really pretty damn good in early testing. The costs are definitely lower than grappa. I just don't know how much. I can't tell you what the motion sensitivity, sensitivity actually is right now. I'd like to put some sort of numbers on it. Uh, but I can tell you it's definitely better than conventional EPI. One issue that is of, of uh, importance is that because of the long echo, spacing. We've got 0.8 millisecond echo spacing. This is a lot of data. We're reading out 128 echoes minus the first one quarter. So we're acquiring over 100 echoes. Each one of those echoes has 128 data points in it. It takes 0.8 milliseconds. So we've got 100 odd times 0.8 milliseconds per set of slices being read out. So that equates to a rather large degree of distortion. Some people are using 0.8 millisecond uh, echo spacing with lower resolution anyway, so it probably won't look much different. But if you're using aggressive echo spacing, then you might uh, start to notice a uh, higher degree of distortion. Let's just pop back to the data a second. By eye? Eh, hard to tell. I'm not sure if that is better or worse distortion than I would be used to. I mean, I don't think I would. I certainly wouldn't have noticed it. If you didn't tell me what it was, I wouldn't have noticed it. And by the way, all of the tricks that we talked about this morning in terms of rotating AP to PA, you know, phase encoding direction, uh, slice direction, all of those things still apply. So now we have 70, 80 slices. We can go do coronal slices and sample along the long axis of the brain. That's perfectly doable. I haven't tried it, by the way, but it could uh, be done. Uh, there is a physical limitation, which I'll talk about perhaps later on, but uh, it, it could, in principle, be done. I just need to test it. There's a lot to do. All right. So the distortion is fairly high, but the thing about distortion is if you do a field map, you can get a first approximation to a fix, um, which is uh, fairly, fairly uh, benign. Okay, so will I let you use it? Yep, 
absolutely. Um, you know, I always let anybody do whatever they want to do. It's, it's your experiment. <laughs> you can break it how you like. Um, but would I encourage people to use it? Yeah, I probably would. I think it's got to the point where I just I don't know enough about it, but I don't have any reasons right now to hold somebody up. And if your questions can be answered by these uh, really uh, super resolution uh, fast scans, then you should just simply take it and, and run with it. Um, and I'll be sauntering along behind trying to figure out where it might break on you. These are the two versions that are out there right now. Uh, Center for Magnetic Resonance Research is the Uni University of Minnesota group. That's um, out of the uh, Human Connectome Project. And this is a work in progress package that Siemens puts out. This is the one I want to get. I haven't got this yet. I'm going to get it. Um, this is Karin Sensenpop's version. This is from Mass General Hospital. The reason why I'm going to work with this one and not this one is because Siemens is already investing in this one. If they bother to push it into a work in progress package, <coughs> it probably means that they're going to turn it into a product at some point. I would like to be involved in product development because otherwise I buy it and I have to complain about it. I'd much rather complain before I buy it. Uh, so if I'm involved in the process, then I can possibly uh, address some of the concerns I might have. <coughs> so this is the one I'm going to work on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So the question then becomes, well, how fast can you go? Um, at 2 point. Uh, two by two by two, the signal to noise is low. But as I mentioned earlier, we've talked about do we really care if the signal is low, if the change in signal is high with a task? That's something that needs to be looked at. Um, 1.5 milli milli uh, millimeter resolution is certainly doable. Uh, the images look quite nice. Uh, but even with the acceleration factors of 8, 10, 12 that uh, people have tried, you're not uh, possible to get, it's not possible to get whole brain coverage, but certainly parts of of the brain are possible with 1.5 millimeter isotropic resolution. Um, David's been playing with the, the highest he can get at 3T and at 7T. And at 3T, his images look pretty lousy and kind of full of artifacts. The signal noise is starting to uh, get down into the single digits. So I don't think that this is, um, at the moment anyway, I don't think this is going to be practical at 3T. But at 7T, it's going to probably be uh, a really neat uh, uh, sequence to use. OK, so some conclusions. Any of you guys can fire any questions you like. So this reverse partial Fourier method, which uh, uh, I should be able to get for you fairly straightforwardly, this is a nice way just to, to tweak uh, a few more slices uh, out of your coverage, just a few percent. It's certainly a lot more robust than Grappa, so I would use that uh, if I could. Modest decrease in, uh, increase in dropout, which uh, we can control somewhat. Uh, we could possibly use thinner slices to, to, to uh, offset some of the dropout, although we give up a little bit of our coverage gain. Uh, we might also be able to tease a little bit, uh, slightly higher in-plane in resolution. So I have one group uh, using partial Fourier, uh, reverse partial Fourier for lateral geniculate nucleus, where they want uh, very high in-plane resolution with no motion sensitivity. And they, their experiments preceded the uh, multiband, so they've been going for about a year. Um, and they're, they're getting some pretty good data. In fact, uh, they just showed some data at a conference I was at a month or two ago. And uh, their data from the 3T, from the Magno and Parvo cellular pathways, was actually more robust, was more reproducible on the, on the 3T than it was on the 7T at Minnesota, which is uh, somewhat surprising given that they had higher spatial resolution at 7T. But there you go. So it does work. Um, it's a, definitely a useful technique to keep in mind. Uh, that's a really uh, critical aspect, I think, of the partial Fourier. It, there's no reference scans, so there's no change in the motion sensitivity of the scan. In fact, you could argue that if you're going faster, you decrease slightly the motion sensitivity, but I think that's, uh, that's probably pushing things a little bit. OK, uh, in plain grappa, uh, you really don't get uh, a, a big coverage gain unless you drop the TE. You get a small benefit, maybe 10%. If you drop the TE, you might get another 10%. That's very comparable to the partial Fourier. Uh, you can, again, increase a little bit the in-plane resolution, but it just, again, it's not a massive difference from the partial Fourier, maybe 10 or 20% uh, smaller voxels. So you might be able to get down to 2.6 millimeter resolution, but it's not a, a huge difference. 
Uh, residual aliasing artifacts I didn't talk about. That's basically uh, motion sensitivity, sensitivity to um, uh, background uh, static gradients. These all produce artifacts of different types. They have different names. You don't really care. Uh, they all come from uh, from the way that the data is encoded. So basically, there are issues. These, they are, these are static. These are temporal, uh, temporally uh, changing. They, you, you don't want either of them. Uh, there's more artifacts of static and dynamic types compared to full case space, uh, unaccelerated EPI. So I think that the motion sensitivity renders the in-plane grapper uh, a big issue for, uh, for motion, uh, a big, big issue for fMRI. I mean, if you can find good subjects, you can probably make it work. So I'm not saying it can't be made to work. I'm just saying I wouldn't suggest that you use it uh, unless you really uh, understand it fully. This fella, on the other hand, SMS EPI, uh, wow, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So it's a very large increase in slice coverage, and that alone, uh, by going faster, permits a massive increase in the in-plane resolution um, because we can extend the, we're allowing ourselves to extend the TE by using partial Fourier. Um, residual aliasing artifacts, that's what I was talking about, this six-fold symmetry in the background. They... They look like I would expect them to look, but I just can't tell you any more about them. Uh, I'd like to understand, uh, for example, whether there's strong uh, sp spatial correlation between pixels. So for those of you who are already doing fMRI, you'll know that when a pixel changes, its next nearest neighbors change to some extent too, because there's a little bit of uh, crosstalk between them. There's a point spread function, right? They're not discrete little tiny boxes. They actually have some weird shape and they interact with each other. What we've just done is acquire six slices simultaneously. So now I'm wondering whether there's autocorrelation between some of the samples that are acquired at the six independent uh, spatial positions. So they're spatially dependent, but temporally codependent. So nobody yet, as far as I know, has looked at the residual aliasing artifacts to see what the autocorrelations look like in these data. That's a really important uh, validation step that needs to happen. Everybody right now is too busy solving the brain to worry about whether their tool is going to, the hammer's going to, the head's going to fly off the hammer. They're just too, too busy banging nails. Right? Every, every, every problem can be addressed with this. Um, so nobody's interested in trying to figure out yet. It's not very sexy. Nobody, nobody get, make, gets tenure for, for solving this stuff. Solve the brain. I'll get you tenure. Um, I also don't yet understand the motion sensitivity, and um, I always do this because I think it's fun. I always search all of the scripts that come out with the new method uh, for the word motion or movement. And as yet, the words motion and movement have failed to appear in every single one of David Feinberg's manuscripts, which uh, to me is a bit of a, a problem. He's, he's just, it, it, it's his child. It's his baby. It's beautiful. And I come along and I go, yeah, but yeah, the kid's ugly. So he doesn't, uh, he doesn't relish that so much, but uh, we really do need to get a handle on this before we uh, do too much. With the one exception that I mentioned several times, if you can't answer the question any other way, use the bejesus out of it because it's the only thing you've got that gives this kind of performance. So I think that uh, the benefits may be worth all the costs. Even though I can't tell you what they are right now, <laughs> we'll figure this out. We'll tell you how, how bad it was. Uh, you'll have too, been too busy having fun and doing good brain stuff. So, since I started with the mock Olympic rings, and now you can see the the visual pun of all the overlaid slices. Maybe it was just subliminal. Maybe I really didn't understand the pun. I just hadn't consciously passed it yet. But anyway, gold medal for sure goes to the SMS EPI. That's the fastest. It's just, that's just Usain. I was going to do some play on Usain Bolt. So that's Usain Bolt right there. He's out of sight. He's already in the bar having a beer before this guy gets in. Anyone ever watched Usain Bolt in the Olympics? I, always, I, I wanted to finish a race one time, turn around and finish backwards. Looking at everyone else. I reckon he could do it. Anyway, silver, honorable mention, goes to the reverse partial Fourier. It's just a good tweak method. And regular partial Fourier, the one that you can just push the button on the scanner right now, that gets an honorable bronze. Um, single shot case base, yeah, it's in the field. It does pretty good. It's generic. You know, it's never going to win a gold medal. It's never going to set a world record, but it's always there. Yeah, it's representing... It's flying the flag for Britain or somebody, some other loser country like Britain. There's a joke there, by the way. If uh, if any 
a British athlete does really well, and they're from Scotland, we call them British. If they're English, we call them English. It's just this thing we do by association. If you watch the, watch the media, it's pretty funny. What is the limit of temporary resolution for simultaneous multi-slide mean, namely, if you sacrifice the brain volume, like you want to scan only six slides, can you, what say you can do it in, like milliseconds? Yes, you can do it, so it will be, uh, 100 odd milliseconds, no, uh, 100 times 0.8 milliseconds for the sampling. So 80 milliseconds for the sampling, plus, um, I'm going to rain on your parade then when I finish answering this question, plus the fat sap pulse, which is essential, that's another 15 milliseconds of overhead, plus some crusher de delays and the RF excitation, which is probably another 7 or 8 milliseconds. So under 100 milliseconds for the whole set. But this, there's a minimum separation between the slices, so uh, you can't. Uh, there, there needs to be a gap because each one of these slices has to fall on an independent coil effectively. That's why the size of the coil elements makes such a difference. So right now, with the hardware that at least I have, I think I can get my slices down to about 40 millimeters separation. After that, then I start to get artifacts, and this is something that needs to be looked at. So I could do a portion of brain, let's say I did uh, 24 slices or 30 slices, a factor of six, uh, then I could keep the separation around about with the slice thickness times uh, 30 over, f over six, so th uh, times five. So what was my slice thickness? Uh, it's two, that's 10, 10 million. That might be a little too, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that would work. You're, you're not requiring uh, ah, so, so, right, so this, so the whole notion of sequential and uh, descending or ascending becomes completely irrelevant in this domain because they're always somewhat interleaved. And it's just a case of whether they're lots interleaved or a little bit interleaved. But they're always interleaved in some respect. One of the tests that I have done is to check to see whether it made any difference. <coughs> just doing simple motion tests, descending versus interleaved, and I couldn't detect any difference at all. So you, it really doesn't matter how you do it. Um, it doesn't also matter how you do it as far as the reconstruction is concerned because the, it's the distance between the slices relative to the coil distances and that's fixed. So how you, whether you sample them differently in time makes no difference. It's the, the, the spatial domain only that makes a difference. So it's about half a, half a second? Something like that. No, it's less than that. <coughs> it's, uh, people are doing, I think if you do lower, so if you do lower accelerations, you can, you can put the slices closer together. So if you restrict your acceleration to, say, a factor of four, and you want to do 12 slices or 16 slices, then you can probably uh, increase the spacing and, and, and uh, get the sampling down to a couple of hundred milliseconds, maybe, maybe 300 milliseconds. So certainly under a half a second. People are doing that now. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. For, for which? For which? Verbal, verbal, response. verbal responses. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, there is very much noise um, from uh, what is the nature of this uh, noise? I mean, from. Verbal responses. Um, I've not looked closely at the data, but uh, we had a postdoc who used, in fact, I think it was an Israeli microphone. I'm pretty sure it was an Israeli microphone. In fact, I think we might have picked your brains on it before we used it. Um, an optical microphone, pie or piezoelectric microphone. I think it's just really. Um, and it, yeah, right. And uh, he, so we were going to, we were going to try and do sparse sampling, so that you could record the. He wanted a verbal response, and he was worried about motion. Um, in all the tests that we did, we found that uh, the the background cancellation, the noise cancellation was so good that people could literally just use a normal conversational voice or a low voice. You could still pick that up and that meant that they didn't have to gesticulate. They didn't have to move forcibly at all. So in his tests, he wasn't able to detect any appreciable difference in the motion. So he just stuck with that microphone and, and we didn't do sparse or anything. We just uh, ran the scanner and the microphone took care of everything. It was wonderful. It was really cool. So I, I, I think if you get the right microphone, then, uh, then you're probably okay. But double check. So the first author's name was Brad Buchsbaum. 
and uh, Bradley Brooks' album that was with Mark Desposito. Um, it was probably two years ago. So uh, look in the paper. Um, find, you'll find out whether or what he did. But uh, as from, my, from my recollection, because he would have talked to me about it, we didn't do anything special for motion. Um, we do have... We, we had one group doing something similar, a uh, similar experiment. They were using sagittal slices because they were worried about movement and they were going to do a 2D uh, uh, motion correction. But, um, and yeah, it worked, but I don't think it was necessary. Yeah, so for that, in that case, you can just use the temporal dis difference because anything that's physical will be immediate, whereas anything that's neural will, will be delayed by five seconds. So you, just, you can just filter it. You just you ignore anything that's strongly stimulus correlated. If it doesn't have a five second lag, ignore it. We haven't looked at any uh, any small uh, structure or anything. That's that's sort of the the sort of the second or third level that I want to look at. Right now, so actually, right now we're trying to reverse engineer the um, the, the uh, spatial uh, uh, sorting algorithm. The papers that have been written really don't describe it very well. So we've, we're, we're trying to get source code, but we're also just trying to sort of piece together how it's working because it doesn't really make much sense to us. Once we've got that, we, we'd like to get some tools that we can control so we can test it. Then we're going to look at phantom uh, uh, movement and then at that point we'll start looking at brain data but it's just too hard to decipher what's going on when you go straight into the brain unfortunately so that's why you know, I can't give you those, those answers. I do know that um, Sonia Bishop's group with Steve Smith and those guys at Oxford have been collecting a bunch of movement data. So they're taking the opposite approach. We, we try and dumb everything down to, to phantoms and you know, very you know, single variable uh, experiments, whereas they've taken a top-down approach. And they did a, um, uh, I can't remember what the focus of the study was, but in any case, they've, done, they've added an extra group where they have intentional motion because they're worried about spurious correlations. This is a resting state scan, by the way. So the big problem that they have is they have no ground truth. I don't know when they're right. It might look all right. You, know, you can interpret ICA any way you like. It always makes sense. Um, but it doesn't mean it's right. So uh, they've added an extra group where they did the same subjects. I think they've tried to mix it so that the subjects they expected to be the best, they've had them move intentionally. And then they're analyzing that data separately. So there should be some fMRI data that will come out of that study that will start to address some of the more nuanced neuro questions with, with motion. But yeah, this is a, a wide open uh, field. I think if, you, if you're using a, a task, if you're doing anything, that's, especially if it's event related, then you know something about what you've driven the system with. So you can, be, you can make principled decisions on what makes sense. And you can ignore stuff that makes no sense. With resting state, that's difficult to do. So if you're doing a, re a rest, um, task experiment, I would just do it and, and interpret it. You, let's put it this way. You're not in any worse shape than anybody else doing fMRI. Right? Everybody else is winging it too. So <laughs> yeah. Was there any papers which compared standard observations uh, using a standard method of movement? The paper, the ink is still wet on that previous paper. It, it's literally 48 hours old. Uh, the, so the first release of those sequences was eight months ago by Minnesota. Um, there's nothing. So, so you're, the, the, the only data you can get, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's fMRI or not, but if you look at the, uh, the Human Connectome Project website, they've just started with it. So there's, there's, there's two Human Connectome Projects, effectively. There's the Minnesota branch, and then there's the Mass General branch. Mass General just started releasing their diffusion data last week. So there's, I think, a dozen data sets with super high resolution diffusion tractography. And they use this method as the basis for that acquisition. I don't know if they have fMRI in that as well. 
Then the Minnesota study, which is in collaboration with Ross Yu, Mar Marcus Reichel, they're doing a twins study with genetics as well. They're going to be scanning like a thousand twins with full genetics. I don't know what the SNP they're looking at. But anyway, um, they're doing resting state plus some other stuff. They've been releasing data, I think, for about two months. And I think most of that is resting state data. So you can definitely get that data and start to, to play with it. Uh, it'll be all multiband. I don't know what they settled on. It's multiband four or multiband eight, something like that. But yeah, you could definitely get some data and just play with it on ICA, just get a feel for it. Is that actually work for twins coming? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, correct. The, the only requirement is that you have a phased array coil. So these uh, small elements, and that you can get each individual data channel separately. So this is the problem with the conventional Siemens scanners is that they combine a lot of the, uh, electronically, they combine a lot of channels before they let, they let you get at the data. So they kind of mess with the data before you can get to it. But that's in their TIM architecture. But these, these uh, big coils, like the, 20, the 32 channel coil, they're research only. Um, and so you get the data one for one from the channels. But I, so that's why I've got to check. You know, I'll let Leon know and Adina know, and you guys can, can stay tuned. But I, I think. I think David Feinberg said that he managed to get things working sort of with um, with the 12 channel coil. There's one, so you have a, t on, on the system here, not, you guys probably have an eight channel coil on the GE. So you need, you're going to need a new coil for sure. Um, and if you need a new, new coil, you need a new electronics. That, that gets expensive. Uh, you guys, the, the new scanner here is a 24 channel coil, I think, no, 18 channel. 20, 20, right. And oh yeah, you have a thirty. Oh, you have a thirty. Oh, then you're good. Then you're golden. Then you don't care. You can do this. You can do this as soon as you get the pulse sequence. You can do it as soon as um, whoever gets to, uh, to do the paperwork can get. Yeah, right. <laughs> you just got to get the get the paperwork. You got to get your research agreement signed. So then you can get the sequence. And then it takes seconds. You can literally have this working in. You know, putting the sequence on takes about a minute. Setting up a protocol takes another five minutes. So. Before you come back with a coffee, I have beautiful data for you. So yeah, you can definitely do that, and you should. You definitely should. Cool. Any more questions? That was, yes, that was my last slide. Fire away any questions. Thank you.